Dr. Shane, let me ask you a few questions. Um, what is mold? Uh, that's a very big question. But mold is basically a heterotrophic organism, which means that it has to get its food from without itself. And so it basically has an organ, it's, it's an organism that has to go and assimilate food from the outside. It's an, it's an inside out stomach, if you will. We, we eat food and we absorb it from the inside. Fungi go out there and dissolve it and then bring it in. They excrete something that dissolves the food, make it, makes it soluble or in, as, a, as a nutrient? Makes it in a form that they can absorb, yes. And that makes it, that can make it, um, that's why mold inspections are important in one way because that's the process that, that damages the um, materials, building materials in a home. Isn't that's it? right. That's, that's destroying the material in order for the mold growth to happen. That's right. That's when all the microtoxins are produced, and and uh, when the when the rot occurs, and when the discoloration and the and the uh, other things that you see with uh, associated with mold growth happen. So, what if the substrate isn't something that's edible? How can mold grow on bathroom tile, or on a piece of metal, or a glass? Mold cannot grow on those things. Mold. There's no mold that can eat a uh, tile or a uh, any grout. So it must it, be on it, something else. What it grows on is the scum, the sc soap and skin and dirt that are on the tile or the glass or in the grout that it grows on. But it, it can't eat anything. It needs a carbon source. And it prefers uh, easily ob obtainable carbon. But if it, in, uh, if it doesn't have that, it'll go after just about anything. And there are some famous examples of uh, mold eating spectacular things: uh, jet fuel, uh, the the laminate in glass in the uh, uh, in the space station, Soviet space station. So hmm. they're very tenacious. Hmm. And um, the the growth that um, an inspector will see in a bathroom is often um, black. Is it mildew? Or the t uh, speak about the terms that an inspector should use so that. We're all on the same page, and we're using the same terms, so we're clear and understandable. Um, is it mildew? What's the difference between mildew? I've heard microbial growth, um, organic matter. Oh, that's organic matter there. What should a home inspector use? What's the difference between those terms? Well, it is microbial growth in a broad sense. A lot of people will blur the lines between microbiology and mycology. And they're not really the same. Uh, we tend to think of germs as this lump sum thing that includes fungi, mold, and bacteria. But they're very, they're very different, and they do quite different things. They're different uh, kingdoms of organisms. So it's really, when you talk about microbial growth, in a general sense, I suppose that's kind of right. But you're really talking about fungal growth or mold growth, and to be very specific. And you ask a really good question about mold and mildew. In the vernacular, people think of clothes and shower curtains getting mildewy. They have a mildew smell. And mold and, and fun, uh, food getting moldy. Well, it's all mold. It's all fungi. Remember that, that all mold are fungi, but not all fungi are mold. So mold are the asexually reproducing fungi. And so, really, mildew is a very specific type of fungus that grows on living plants outside, usually. So there's no reason to talk about mildew inside. Hmm. It's a misnomer. Hmm. What, um, what does mold need to grow? Um, it needs, we know it can grow on uh, amazing stuff, but it's, it's, it's not actually growing on the glass or on the tile itself. What, what conditions? does mold need to grow? Mold can grow just about anywhere. Uh, they can grow at body temperatures and above. They can grow at room temperature, and they can grow at quite cold temperatures. Uh, everybody knows the example of them spoiling food in the refrigerator. And they can grow on dead fish, which has very low water availability. They can grow on uh, homemade jam. You know, you can see, you think of homemade jam as very wet, but it's actually, there's no available water there. But you can get some things, a particular organism uh, called Eurotium, that will grow on jam. It's 
even though it's a, quite a desert. And, and everything's water availability. But they do need a carbon source. They can be particular about carbon sources. They need actually four things to grow. And to best explain it, I suppose, we ought to draw it. Hmm. Sure. Now we're going to need the board. Okay. <laughs> when you think about how mold grows and what it needs to grow with, you need certain things. Most people draw a triangle for the requirements. You need food, you need water, you need the mold itself. And of course you're going to need temperature too. However, it's important to remember, remember that it's really a pyramid. And the top of the pyramid is really time. So you've got four requirements needed for mold growth. The food, the water source, the mold itself, and time. And most mold will germinate in right conditions immediately and start to grow. But it takes 24 to 48 hours for it to really uh, be able to be seen and sporulate. So these four factors are really important to remember when you're thinking about requirements for mold growth. So you're saying if a house has moisture intrusion, um, it isn't a 48-hour waiting period before mold growth. It could be immediate if it has food, water, the mold itself. It could be immediate. It could be growing almost immediately, instantly. Absolutely. Under the right conditions, mold can germinate very quickly. And a building is a perfect place for mold growth because there's a, there's a lot of food, a lot of building materials, a lot of substrates, drywall, um, wallpaper, and um, it's a controlled environment. And the occupants want to keep warm, and so the temperature is just about the right um, uh, range. It's really moisture that's the key to not only controlling mold, but finding the mold. Isn't that right? That's right. Water is a great limiting source because you've got all the other things present already. And without water, no mold growth. It's as simple as that. And that's why inspections are so very important because you want to look for water. And one of the most important things that a home inspector can ask is, have you had a recent water incursion? That's a, that's a very important question because you're going you're gonna to find mold. You're going to find fungi. You're going to find bacteria because we're swimming in it. Finding those things are not remarkable. Finding these things after a water incursion is important because mold damages substrates. And what if the mold inspector goes in the house, does the visual examination, he's carrying the humidity meter and the moisture meter, and there's no moisture. That doesn't mean that there isn't any mold growth because mold can stick around for a while without moisture. Is that true? That's correct. Because what you're really showing is in a mold inspection, especially when you get a confirmation lab report, is that you're looking at do you have current or former growth of mold? And you can't really tell. You really can't tell how old mold growth is. There's not a good way to tell. So there are some indications, but they're complicated. So by and large, you cannot tell how old this mold growth is. What if an inspector visually does an examination, non-invasive examination of a building, and finds something that appears to be mold growth, apparent mold growth? Um, the EPA says that if it's visible, mold growth, testing, in most cases sampling, is unnecessary. What would you say about an inspector going in and finding something, um, black, green, brown, fuzzy, and um, deciding to take a sample in order to confirm that it actually is mold growth? Well, that's correct. You know, you don't have to know the, uh, be a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. That's probably the most quoted Dylan song there is. But if you want to know if it is mold and what kind of mold it is, you have to sample. Now, remember that all these samples that are taken need to be driven by some kind of an idea, some kind of a hypothesis. So if what you want to do is show that there's moisture there, well, you probably don't need a mold sample. If you want to know what kind of mold that is, then you're going to have to have it analyzed. If you want to know if it's mold, you're going to have to have it analyzed. 
there are different reasons to sample. For instance, uh, uh, insurance companies will often have you sample black growth to confirm that it's mold so that you can sample again when it's gone to, uh, after it's been remediated to show that that mold is gone. Mm -hmm. And those are legitimate reasons to sample. Even though in the first case it may be obvious, it's still a way that you can show positively that you had a certain type of mold, you've remediate, remediated it, and now it's gone. What are the main reasons why an inspector would sample for mold, either by air or um, by surface, or both? What are the main reasons? Well, client needs are a big reason, and that's why education is so very important, to know why you're there to sample and what you're doing with the sampling devices. So clients will often want to sample an environment to see if they have an amplifica amplification of mold. And so client needs, of course, drive the whole business. It, client needs drive every business. And so that is a very important reason to sample. Some people feel really good after having done a mold uh, survey that they don't have elevated levels of mold. And they'll have peace of mind in that. Or they may want to buy a new house and they want to make sure that it's mold free, relatively mold free, knowing that there's going to be some mold there, but knowing that there's not an amplification of mold. And so that's a very important reason, a completely legitimate reason to sample. Another reason would be to see if you have hidden mold. You know, it's obvious when you walk into a house and you've got water dripping off the rafters and you've got lots of green and black growth, you don't need to be a sampler to solve that. What you want to do is take care of it appropriately, but you know, if, you've, if you suspect you've got hidden mold or if you've cleaned up mold and it's still, uh, people are maybe being symptomatic or you want to make sure that it's all gone, then you can do a, sampler, uh, do a sampling regime to see that you haven't got hidden mold. What if you um, don't see any visible apparent mold growth but you um, use your senses and you smell uh, a musty odor or a moldy smell, um, is that reason enough to um, take a sample? It may be. Uh, we know that we, can, we have acute senses of smell and it can indicate that you've got a microbial growth or mold growth. You know, you may have, it may be a, a bacterial problem. So finding that source of water, and the only reason you'd have that is if you had water or you having a water problem now, and you want to find that before it becomes a bigger problem. So sense of smell is a legitimate way to go looking for mold, and it may need to be sampled. But to sample just because you smell uh, may not be a legitimate reason to sample unless the client really wants you to do it. But you know, mold sampling is really a case-by-case -case battle. You go in, people, you're there for any number of reasons, you know, there's no reason to just indiscriminately sample. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's what the home inspectors want to do. I think they want to be smart about it, know why they're there. You know, they're there. Mold is just another arrow in the quiver of a mold inspector, uh, what they have to attack a problem. They're there to uh, protect the building envelope because people poorly maintain their homes. They may have had a problem. They may have a water incursion. They may have had... Um, a lot of rain, they may have no rain. In some parts of the country when you don't have a lot of rain, where you need to have rain to wet the clay soils, you'll get cracks in the foundation, so when you do water or get, get uh, rain, water will come in. So there's a lot of reasons uh, a home inspector is, is the right kind of a person to do this kind of sampling. So it's just another arrow in the quiver of their armory. The word contamination is used a lot in the mold inspection business, looking for mold contamination or this room has been contaminated. Um, can you speak about the word contamination? There's a lot of misinformation about contamination. I like to think of contamination as not the presence of microbes, you know, bacteria and fungi, because we go back to that idea that you can never get away from uh, those things. Only in very specific controlled environments will you not have fungi and bacteria, and probably only fungi, you probably always have bacteria. So contamination ought to be thought of as amplification of mold 
if we're going to talk about mold contamination. So amplification of mold in an environment that is built to keep that mold amplification out. So in that case, homes are a place where you do, would consider that to have uh, an environment where mold should not amplify. So just because you find mold on a surface or in the air does not make anything contaminated. So it has to, actually has to be amplified in that environment. Does it have to have, um, then, if you're going to use the word contamination, there has to be a threshold limit value set, and then it has to be above that to be contaminated? No, there are no threshold uh, limit values here in this work. That's why I think uh, a control sample is very important and why historical samples are very important when labs compare th your sample to a historical reference that they've built that uh, you can tell what is probably normal for your area and for your kind of building. Uh, and you know the, the diversity of the mold that's there should be normal. You know, you shouldn't have a lot of water indicating mold. Uh, certain mold are growing in a, in a building where there's been water and water for a long time. And those are the kind of things, that they're kind of red flag mold, if you will. So there's a, there's a, um, a sample device that can take a sampling of a mold. And um, if it's a fungus indicator, fungi indicator, something, a mold indicator, something that indicates that there's something abnormal inside that controlled environment inside that building, something specific. Is there such a device? If you're if you're talking about taking a, a, a sample and testing it on site, yes, yeah, there there is that device, but it's prone to false positives. So it's like a pregnancy test. It's a presumptive test. So it doesn't really tell you what you've got because it could be a false positive. It also could be a false negative. It might be there, and you might have a negative. Uh, result. The best, I think the traditional samples that we have shown uh, are the best way to look at mold. Um, there are um, molds that produce allergens. I don't know how many. I've, I've read a bunch of numbers. Over 60 allergens have been identified. Is it possible to, if a person, if your client has um, an assumption or, or has a concern about allergies, they have asthma, a lot of health uh, problems, um, they may request a home inspector uh, and a mold inspector to go in and sample for these particular allergens. Is that possible and get that answer for your client? It is possible. Uh, normally um, they're restricted to just a couple of the on the mold but they can be tested for. There aren't any threshold values for that but you can look at uh, relative amounts if you've got low significant or high amounts of that allergen. So a, a mold inspector really goes in and does a lot of non-viable sampling, and then the results come out as counts. We're looking for low, medium, or elevated levels of this amount because, in general, um, you shouldn't have mold growth in the house at an elevated um, level or, or spores at an elevated level compared to the outdoor. So you do a control sample, air sample on the outside, you recommend two in, in those uh, conditions. And then you compare it with that sampling, air sample on the inside, and we're really looking for something elevated. Not an absence, but an elevation mm -hmm. account. Is that That's right? right. That's correct. Okay. Um, when does an inspector not sample for mold? Well, there's a number of reasons why a mold inspector would not want to sample. One uh, most obvious one would be when it's not safe to sample. You never want to jeopardize your own health uh, for a sample. You know, if you've got uh, dilapidated conditions or if you've got such a health concern uh, in terms of, of amplification of mold and you're not protected, uh, I would not sample. I, I, would, uh, I would defer that. Uh, another reason you would probably not want to sample, you'd want to defer it to another professional, would be if you have a client who is currently under a physician's care, they know they're immunocompromised, and they're wanting to know specifics about the kinds of things that are in their home that affect their health. I think that's a, a, a legitimate place for an industrial hygienist and uh, that, that can provide information through the lab to the physician. So I think a home inspector is wise to prevent that, uh, to not sample during that, that time. 
The other thing uh, I would not sample, another scenario I would not sample in, is when there's uh, current litigation. You know, I think that's probably uh, a judgment call, and everybody has their own thresholds, if you will, for comfort in litigation, but uh, I think it's wise to, to stay away from those uh, cases where there's current litigation, they're calling you in to be a mold expert, uh, because you're clearly not a mold expert. Uh, you know, home inspectors need to know their limitations. They're not mold experts, they're, they're building experts. And if they want a mold expert, uh, they need to hire a mold expert. The second reason you gave not to sample was because of health issues. Should an inspector comment upon um, health uh, effects in relation to mold exposure? Is there um, a direct connection that a, um, a mold inspector can uh, make and then give recommendations to their client about health effects and mold exposure? I think in a limited case, yes. I think that uh, there are some uh, sites, EPA sites, uh, CDC sites, that, uh, and certainly published literature that indicate there are some uh, health implica uh, implications for mold. I think in a limited sense that would be okay. And there's some pretty good references out there. But in general, uh, you're not a physician, you don't want to provide medical advice, you don't have a medical license, so it's best to avoid specifics about health uh, and the health effects of mold on individuals. And so if they just limit it to that, I think they'll be okay. What's, the, what's then the purpose of getting a mold inspection? What, what can a mold inspector comment upon? Well, a mold inspector ought to comment upon the reasons you've got mold. And that's really why they're there. They're there to find out and to protect your building envelope, the, the biggest investment most people make in their life. And mold is just another thing that is present that indicates you may have a problem, a general problem, maybe a specific problem, maybe a specific problem in, in, the, in the roof. But, you know, uh, grade, drainage, all those things come into play when you're looking at a building inspection. So because you have mold, mold is not a golden spike. It doesn't sh tell you that the occupants are going to be sick. It doesn't tell you that you have to condemn the building. All it tells you is that you've got water intrusion somewhere for a, uh, an amount of time that was sufficient for it to grow and that we know that wet buildings are not healthy because they carry a lot of things with it, insects, bacteria, uh, mycotoxins. It's not healthy to be in wet buildings. So that's the primary concern. You can take care of the water, you can deal with the mold, you've done your job. So how important is it to hire a mold inspector who is adequately trained and educated? You cannot have enough education. It's of the most importance to continue your education, to take advantage of the courses that are available, the literature that becomes available. Anything that you can get that builds your expertise is important because what you want in anybody, whether it's your paramedic, your physician, your dentist, you want to see that not only do they have the minimum qualifications to enter their field, but that they have, you know, maybe board certified, they're specialized, they go for continuing education. You know, all, all dentists and doctors have to go and get continuing education units. They can't right. just become a doctor and then never go to school again. So getting educated in any way you can through reputable sources is extremely important because it builds your expertise base and you're able to associate what you learn in courses put it together what you know in the field and give a more of an added value for your product and clients appreciate that they appreciate the value and they appreciate the knowledge base how should a mold inspector interpret laboratory results i think that lab results from uh, are just one part of a home inspector's report and what you're really trying to show in this report is what the condition of the building is and a mold report can help you do that and a mold report will show you do you have mold amplification where you shouldn't and do you have contamination as we've narrowly defined it in that room or that building and so the mold report is just one part of the home inspectors full report do you recommend including that 
laboratory result with a full complete mold inspection report? I think it's important to, uh, to provide the data from the mold report from the uh, lab because it shows a couple of things. It shows the data that you're drawing maybe your conclusions on and that it also shows that the lab that you used is fully accredited. Okay. I'm in a lot of um, historic homes and attic spaces and sometimes we see bird droppings, even bird nests and um, a mold inspector can actually sample that area to find um, fungi or mold that have health effects for many people. Is that right? That's correct. There are uh, some uh, pretty nasty fungi that are actually pathogenic. They actually cause disease in those scenarios. If that's the case, I think that uh, a home inspector needs to be have full respirators uh, and, and Tyvek suits before they even uh, go in there. It's very important to protect yourself and then you're going to want to follow strict protocols uh, for sampling and any remediation that, that might be done. But uh, first rule is to protect yourself. So if you see that situation, you're going to want to be fully protected, full respirator. It could be somewhat serious. It isn't um, some allergic symptoms of um, dizziness or headache or sneezing or something like that. That's right. They're actually pathogenic disease-causing organisms, so it's very dangerous. In fact, there are some places in the United States that are posted uh, in the forest uh, to not go in because of this, uh, because of histoplasma, and so they actually warn you of the disease because the, the bird droppings are so are so um, prevalent. Hmm. What about mycotoxins? What are mycotoxins? Mycotoxins are simply um, fungi produced toxic substances. And a mold inspector can sample for mycotoxins? Not generally. Mycotoxins are a uh, highly controversial area. So we don't know uh, anything about thresholds. We uh, can sample for them. It's a long sample time. Uh, it's a very specialized test, a very expensive test. And like I said, we're not sure what to do with it when we get it. Uh, for instance, some uh, penicillia can produce over 100 toxins. So you can, just because we can identify something doesn't mean we know what to do with it. So it is, it is probably the most controversial part of mold in humans. Uh, the, the mycological volatile organic compounds and mycotoxins so it's, it's something that probably home inspectors should stay away from. If, um, if a mold inspector samples, does, does a sampling, and the result comes back penicillium, can they say, well, the penicillium um, sometimes produces mycotoxins, which is toxic? Can they make that connection or no? I would not make that connection. Uh, that's really a, a, a health advisory, hmm. and so I don't think that I would make that connection because you don't know what... Uh, what species of penicillium it is. So it's irrelevant to say, you know, I think it's not relevant to say that, that you've got mycotoxins, potential mycotoxins, because it's almost guaranteed you've got mycotoxins. What level you've got and what kind you've got are the important part. And why would it be important anyway if, if they're not suffering from any ill effects? So it's a very controversial um, part of, the, part of the, the environmental mold business. What, what about this term toxic mold? Is it just uh, a term that's been thrown around? It is a term that's been loosely applied. Yeah. I think it's safe to say that uh, all the mold can be allergenic, uh, and some of them may be toxic, but we don't know what those thresholds are for people, and I think it's not a good idea to talk, so, talk about toxic mold. A mold inspector should not put the term toxic mold anywhere in the report. I don't think it's advisable at all. And shouldn't be speaking of mycotoxins very much, maybe just in general terms, maybe defining what it is, because they are not actually going to sample for mycotoxins. That's right. It's better not to, to field those questions at all. In fact, it's probably better that if they really want to know, if the client really wants to know, perhaps they can contact the lab. Uh, they may uh, be able to send them some literature, but they won't advise them either. 
um, they're going to have to talk to their health professionals. It's, it's very frustrating for a client. I, I understand that if they want to know about mycotoxins, they ask their home inspector who refers them to the lab, who refers them to a physician, and they haven't got a physician already. So it just lets you know how controversial it is and how little we know about it. It can be frustrating for the client, but home inspectors are best to avoid that. Let's speak about developing hypotheses and how those drive the sampling. What types of hypotheses should an inspector and their client develop prior to making any type of sampling? Well, I think having a plan is a very important thing because finding mold is quite unremarkable in a home. Uh, and so it goes back to this idea that we're swimming in this, this uh, field of uh, the sea of, of mold. So you want to go in, and, and if, you're, if your hypothesis is you're going to find mold, that you're going to self-fulfill that prophecy because you are going to find mold. Rather, if you can test the idea that there, this is a house that does not have amplification of mold, and you find amplification of mold, then you have a, 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 an unexpected result that wasn't driven by the fact that you want to find mold there because it, it, and it uncomplicates and unclouds the suspicion for uh, uh, criticisms that are laid at, at home inspectors all the time that uh, you're going to find mold, you want to find mold, and so you're going to find mold. The inspector went in there biased, knowing that he's going to find something, find mold, and then they do. So the hypothesis is to uh, assume that this building is healthy and normal and um, sample, and then if you find something elevated with that sampling result, then that's um, a, a more valid result, has more um, authenticity or impact. It's a stronger argument uh, for the fact that you have an unusual condition. So you're, look, you're going in and you're finding mold as a result of water. And that's really important to understand that mold is not a standalone stand problem. Mold is associated with building defects and problems in other areas. So uh, all covered under defects, I suppose. So you're, you're going in there to, to make sure that the building envelope is secure. So when you find mold and you find it amplified, then you have a case for cleaning it up. What if a mold inspector goes in and does a visual examination, doesn't find apparent mold growth, but finds um, other conditions that may be conducive to mold growth? let's say, uh, water stains or water damage. Um, would sampling be um, something that you would recommend just to confirm that that area there has or does not have mold growth? That's a, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure that I have a direct answer. Water stains, especially small water stains, uh, are probably insignificant. What you need to do is, is look at why that water stain's there look behind the wall perhaps or, or you know get permission to do some invasive testing or move some some tile to see why that water stains there and of course you look around and maybe it's sitting be, below a, a drip pan or be uh, below a, a, a pipe that gets condensation then certainly it's not going to be a problem I, I think that mold sampling has to be part of a systematic sampling regime uh, inspection regime and uh, you really need a compelling reason to sample for mold. And there are lots of those compelling reasons, as we've discussed, but uh, just to, to sample indiscriminately for mold because you might have a water stain, I don't think is advisable. What about um, high humidity, relative humidity? What if it's excessive? Um, a, a mold inspector is carrying an instrument that can sample that or measure that in a room, and it's very high in that one room. Maybe there's a musty odor or not. Should he sample for uh, and take an air sample, see if there's something in the air? Well, certainly, under those conditions, an air sample is the quickest, cheapest way to see if you've got hidden contamination of mold. So if you've got uh, mold that, that uh, is either former growth or current growth and producing lots of spores behind the wall, uh, it's l highly likely that you'll see it in the air, and it's a very quick and cheap way to do it. So having one of those instruments, one of those devices that can measure humidity levels, 
is almost essential for a mold inspector. I, I think it's important. Well, Dr. Shane, thank you for being part of the online video course for mold training. It was um, a pleasure. Thank you very much. You're welcome, and I commend your efforts. Thank you. The inspector shall perform a non-invasive visual examination of the readily accessible, visible, and installed systems and components of the building. So let's take a look and this building here, a residential single dwelling unit. Um, we start on the roof. You're not required to get up on the roof and walk on the roof, but if I do, I take digital pictures of every system and component that I'm inspecting, the condition of this roof, is recorded digitally with my digital camera. The condition here is in pretty good shape. I don't see any damage to the roof. The condition is good. A roof in poor condition can cause water problems and that's what we're looking for. Moisture intrusion. Take a look at the gutters here. They're clean. A clogged gutter is a condition that could bring in moisture into the house. The flashing around the ventilation fans were not installed properly. The flashing around the vent pipes, sewer vent pipes coming up through the roof, they're in deteriorated condition so there could be water penetration into the attic through those areas. That should be in the report. There are other areas, fields of the roof to be inspected and the flashing is included. You have to inspect where the roof shingle meets the wall. That intersection there is important. A roof in deteriorated condition should be reported and then if you can get underneath that roof and look for moisture intrusion that would be ideal. I'm looking for step flashing underneath the shingles. That area is critical along that edge. It's been sealed down so I really can't pull up any shingles there. And that's the front part. Take a look at the ventilation of the attic space. Water damage at the returns there. And then there's another fan that's not been installed properly. The flashing is in poor condition and that's a condition conducive to mold growth, water intrusion. One area I was able to see some step flashing, so that's good. I know it's installed. Flashing is important because this fan could leak during a rainstorm, allow water intrusion, and then mold growth could occur. Take a look at the window areas. Also look at the chimney stacks. Water can travel down from the top of the chimney stack into the house interior down in the basement by the heating system. That should be repaired. It's an open gap prone to water penetration. Take a look at the general condition of the stack. We don't want water intrusion going through. The flashing area around the chimney stack was in poor shape. You can see the open edges. That should be reported. Any area that would allow water to penetrate the interior of the building envelope should be reported. General condition of that brick is in great shape. The crown material is good. Take a look at the intersection between the chimney stack and the siding. That should be sealed up. This flashing on this stack was in poor shape, very loose, and we had indications of water problems in the attic space, visible from the attic space. Window flashing, and then down um, following the water, take a look at the downspouts, and right here is some grading problems, puddles, mud. When you see areas of missing grass, that's an indication of standing water. The grading is negative or neutral, really, no slope to it. The crawl space vents have been blocked. That could be a problem. Water puddles near the pool, the grading is very neutral. It's, it's a flat yard. There was a garden area up against the siding. Gutter strap is loose. Don't want the gutter to spill over and dump right next to the house foundation.
Everything should be sloped away. Front looks pretty good. Take a look where building materials, the different materials, intersect each other. Look at the siding, flashing, trim, cladding. Any damage should be noted. Any open gaps should be noted. Need to be properly flashed and sealed. General condition of the siding here was in pretty good shape. The vinyl siding was good. Check the downspouts as you move around the house and the flashing around the windows, the capping. Don't want loose capping. The brick and masonry was in great shape. Didn't find any problems with the window around the building materials. This front porch has settled, cracked. Fortunately, settled in a good direction away from the house. Look where the front porch intersects with the house. In the garage, the driveway should be sloped away. We don't want a driveway that allows moisture to trap water, groundwater, surface water, to travel towards the house foundation, foundation or the garage foundation. The siding had some clearance between the bottom of the siding and the grating, which is great. The siding wasn't wicking up moisture. Take a look at the slider door area in the back. The capping needs to be tight. Those are areas of concern there for moisture intrusion where the siding meets something else. Any penetration through the siding needs to be inspected. That fan's okay. The dryer vent is okay. It wasn't loose. Check the bottom corners of the doors for moisture intrusion, wood rot, and water damage. Sealant around the light fixtures. Note restrictions to your inspection like bushes and vegetation. More puddles, standing water. Just some general shots and we don't inspect little sheds, metal sheds, not part of the inspection. This is the crawl space. We're inside the building, inside the crawl space, which has major water problems. It has flooded in the past, about six inches. There's um, apparent visible mold growth. Sampling was done there to confirm that it was, in fact, mold, not just something white and fuzzy. Look at the sewer lines, the visible sewer lines, to make sure they are not leaking. A leaking sewer line can cause moisture problems and mold growth. Look in the bays at the joist ends, the foundation wall. Look for structural problems that are caused by moisture. Poke around in areas of concern. There's mold growth there. White stuff is, is actually mold growth. There's active water penetration. There's moisture intrusion. That should be in the report. Crawl space was flooded in the past, and there's mold on the wooden components. It's actually not a dirt floor, it's actually concrete, rough concrete with dirt that has been brought in because of all the flooding and moisture problems. Efflorescence on the walls, the salt deposits. Take a look at the water supply lines that are visible. There's mold there on that beam in the floor choice above. Take a look at the pockets, see if water damage has caused, uh, moisture intrusion has caused water damage to any structural components. There's moisture damage there and water damage. Lack of ventilation and a big introduction of moisture and humidity. Um, the crawl space was musty, had a, a bad odor in it and musty odors should be noted in your report. Look at the ends of the floor joists. There was an oil storage tank inside. This is on the East Coast in the United States. And uh, you know that brings in 
other odors and other contaminants. It wasn't supported very well. There's the oil spill there. All the plumbing lines going up to the bathroom fixtures above. There's the crawl space vent. It's completely blocked. Take some pictures of where the toilets are. There's water stains coming from that toilet flange there. Could be a loose seal. There's a dripping valve at the boiler line. It's dripping on the floor. Looks like it's been dripping for a long time. And get into the garage. It was an attached garage. A detached garage should be um, a separate structure. This one is attached, and you can't take an air sample in a in a uh, an attached garage as an air sample as a control sample. It's an attached garage. It's part of the building structure. Note your inspection restrictions. I found that attached garages like this one has moisture problems at the bottom, where the um, bottom plate is actually below the concrete floor of the garage. But I didn't find any mold or moisture problems. And because I was looking at the top of the chimney stack looking for moisture, I'll take a look on the inside of the fireplace. Run water at all the fixtures. This is the laundry tub. Main water valve, water meter, those old valves. If they're used, the stems sometimes drip and leak. Any water leak should be noted and reported as moisture intrusion. By way of a leak, take a look at the boiler system, make sure it's not leaking. Any water system, water filtration system looking for mold, that's the discharge of the system, softener system. Air tanks sometimes leak at the boiler looking for water dripping out of the flue pipe. There's the TPR valve on the boiler. Sometimes they're discharging or dripping. The pump on the hot water um, the boiler system sometimes drips at the gaskets, looking for streaks coming down the chimney stack. Take pictures of the interior, especially the lower lowest level. Just to note the um, the condition and maybe inspection restrictions. You don't have to look at the electrical panel. This is a mold inspection. Looking at the interior of the windows, looking for moisture intrusion, water damage, condensation, any signs of visible mold growth, any signs, visible signs of moisture. I was able to pull back the paneling a little bit. in a closet space. Sometimes stored items up against a cold exterior wall will have mold growth behind it because of condensation. Taking pictures of the floor. In this house the the carpeting was pulled out. Doesn't mean there was mold but um, just noted in the report. Who knows? and all the doors, exterior doors, and then the bathroom fixtures. Flush all the toilets, run water at the sinks, hot and cold. Look for water damage at the tiles. The soap dish should be pulled a little bit. There shouldn't be any open grout lines. Run the shower. Try to go, um, try to make the tub fill up with water and drain properly, and then go underneath and see if it's leaking looking for any kind of water intrusion by plumbing leak. Like the pound in the bottom rows of the tiles to see if there's any water damage. That sealant should be redone. The grout should be redone. That's a tiled shower. And take a look for mold around the bathroom exhaust fans and condensation on the windows. just some general condition shots. Didn't see any signs of patching or painting. Sometimes you can't get to um, the windows because there's a lot of stuff, personal items. But that window there, I was concerned about some moisture at the bottom corner and there may 
been a, an air conditioner unit installed there. Take a look at all the windows looking for condensation problems. These are insulated, but sometimes the uh, older single pane windows will have condensation issues. And then get into the attic space. Take a look around. If you could walk around or crawl around, protect yourself. There weren't any structural problems or water damage, but a lack of insulation may have been causing some moisture issues. There's an introduction of a lot of excessive humidity. The bathroom fans are exhausting into the attic space. There's a lack of insulation, missing insulation there. No major structural problems. Ventilation fans of any kind should be inspected. This is a roof fan. It did turn on. It was functional. Missing insulation at the attic access. Kitchen. We had a, um, a cracked pipe at the kitchen sink. That should be noted in the report. The fan was kind of old. Ventilation fan with a bunch of mold on top of it. Just needs to be cleaned up. Run the appliances that use water like the dishwasher. There was another uh, hatch found later on in the inspection for a second attic space and the ventilation fans should be inspected. Turn them on if you can. No moisture intrusion, no water damage, no mold growth in the, the attic spaces. But we had conditions conducive to mold growth. Lack of insulation in the bathroom fans. So that was the uh, visual inspection of this of that building. In summary, we have some flashing problems on the roof. Could allow water to penetrate down the chimney stack. Around the flashing of the chimney stack, we had standing water on the exterior grounds. Neutral grating. Crawl space vents, lack of ventilation. The crawl space obviously had moisture intrusion, apparent visible mold growth which was surface sampled. Active water penetration in the crawl space. No major structural damage. Some sealant at the grout. Lack of insulation thickness and missing insulation and bathroom fans in the attic space and an active plumbing leak. So we took some outdoor samples, two outdoor samples. We did a visual examination we had areas of concern, moisture intrusion, water damage a little bit, musty odors, parent mold growth, and we had a lot of conditions conducive to mold growth inside and out. So we took some surface samples in the areas of concern, concern to confirm, and we took some um, air samples also. Here's another building. Got up on the roof. This roof's in great shape. It was new, but sometimes Shingles crack, um, hailstorms can cause problems, and I like to check the valleys and the ventilation and the condition. There's the ridge vent. The gutters were very clean, so we didn't have any problems collecting the roof water and taking it away from the house. You had to check out all the planes, all the surfaces of the roof system. Any roof penetration should be inspected. Valleys, roof fans, especially the flashing. This flashing was done really well, as you can see. And any smaller roofs and roof um, attic vents should be inspected. And the flashing. Some flashing is concealed with snow, You're not required to move snow. porch, unlike the first building, was uh, in good shape. And taking a look at the exterior grounds, maybe some window well covers over those windows would be a good, sh uh, good idea. Inspection restrictions, the downspouts were not discharging far enough away from the, the house. 
like to get underneath the deck to see what's going on there. Sometimes dryers are exhausting underneath the deck, causing water damage or mold. The driveway is in great shape. It's, everything's sloped away. Take a look at the doors and windows, where the building materials, different building materials meet and intersect. The siding was in great shape not required to use a ladder to get up to the second floor level windows or anything like that. And the flashing area where the deck meets the siding is a critical area to inspect. Especially at the doors, just like this one. Sometimes the tread has problems. Downspout wasn't really great. It was depositing at that critical area. The front porch is missing a gutter, but it wasn't causing problems. There is an HVAC system inside, so we know we're going to take a air sample, at least one air sample. The garage interior was in great shape. No moisture. Take a look at the floor, the walls, the ceiling. We have an HVAC system. Dirty air filter is a condition conducive to mold growth. The coil had mold on it, black mold, uh, apparent visible mold. So we surface sampled that. And it had a humidifier of some kind from Sears, maybe like a heat exchanger, but it was so old, um, probably just filled with uh, mold growth inside. So a delayed maintenance of a heating system and also this um, uh, heat air to air heat recovery ventilation system should have been uh, noted in the report. Take a look at any visible plumbing drain lines and plumbing supply lines. Don't have to look inside the electrical panel. Um, there was actually moisture coming through inside the electrical panel. There was a leak following the main electric line. And there's a perimeter trench in this basement. It was filled with water, as you can see. It's behind the wall. Take a look at the water meter. Sometimes condensation forms on cold lines coming into the house. Water meters sometimes leak. There was a leak at this plumbing fixture, the laundry tub drain was dripping water. Actually, it was, it was improperly installed. Uh, dryer was missing, but the vent was there. Take a look on the inside. Take a look at the hot water source. Make sure the valves are not dripping. The TPR on the hot water tank should not be dripping. Then take a look around. There's a, a chase underground for an uh, air duct. There's a toilet flange. And there's that perimeter trench filled with water, just standing water. It's not doing anything. And then we started seeing moisture coming through the block foundation, water deposits, signs of water, moisture intrusion. It's hard to see everything. I like to open up the ceiling panels and take a look above, see what's going on above. There wasn't any anything going on here, no visible mold, no apparent mold, no moisture intrusion, no condensation problems above the ceiling. Even though the basement, um, the lower floor had a lot of water problems. Don't have to move insulation. There's moisture in the corner. Take a look at the pockets where the main beams rest into the foundation wall. There's where the deck is attached to the house. There's moisture coming through the the block foundation and the sump pumps were not professionally installed. They're not working, prone to failure, unreliable. Take a look underneath the basement steps. That's a good place for high humidity. Looks good from afar, but when you get closer, the crawl space foundation has moisture coming through it, salt deposits, efflorescence. That was on the floor, and so I took a look above. It didn't seem all that interesting until I pulled the insulation away and then well, there's a lot of moisture coming through, a lot of water damage. Major moisture intrusion and water damage. Apparent mold growth. There's a water puddle with salt deposits, efflorescence. There's that wall of the crawl space. So the crawl space had moisture problems and ventilation problems. In the attic, no flooring, can't walk around but I found mold there. It's very difficult to move around. You don't have to. 
be very careful, but look as much as you can from that access. Try to reach the ventilation fans, any fans in the attic, but be careful because uh, there are electrical problems often in the attic space. Protect yourself. And we had water at the roof leak area there at the ridge. Insulation was great. Missing insulation, though, at the access panel. Downstairs, we're looking at the fixtures in the bathroom, looking for water damage at the tiles, run water at all the fixtures, the toilets, the sink drain lines, water supply lines, the valves, plumbing access panels. Often you'll find mold growth there if there's a leak. And then in the interior, it's just general, looking around, looking for areas of concern, moisture intrusion, using your nose for musty odors, water damage. There's the bathroom fan. Oftentimes that's an con uh, area of concern. This was a leak, stripping in the cabinet of the sink, bathroom sink. It's an easy fix. Run water at the kitchen. Even turn on the garbage, garbage disposal, see if that will leak for you. Run the dishwasher and even the stove, ventilation stove, it should work. This one wasn't. So in summary, we had an HVAC system which needs to be inspected and sampled. We had mold, apparent mold growth on the coil, water problems around the bottom of the unit, an old heat recovery ventilator system, delayed maintenance is a condition conducive to mold growth, active leak, standing water, moisture intrusion through the foundation, some pumps not working, standing water, major water damage, moisture intrusion, apparent visible mold growth, there's the attic, moisture intrusion and apparent visible mold growth in the attic, and another plumbing leak there. So when we arrived, took two outdoor air samples used for comparison. There, we did a visual examination. We had areas of concern, moisture, water damage, musty odors, apparent mold growth, conditions conducive to mold growth. We took surf surface samples to confirm and in interior air samples to compare with outside.